Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am Krista Burns at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover NLC activities, any Nebraska library topics of interest to Nebraska librarians. We have NLC staff do sessions like we are today. We also bring in guest speakers sometimes to make it more interesting. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. They are free, and they are recorded. So um, we are recording today's, so anyone who is not able to attend live on Wednesday mornings can um, listen to and watch our recordings afterwards. This morning, as I said, we have one of our NLC staff, Sally Snyder, who's going to talk to us about books for kids and teens. All right. And I will just pass over the mouse okay. and control to Sally. Oh, I have control. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I just want most of, for all of you to know that this is going to be almost exactly like my presentation at NL, NLA NEMA. I did switch out a few things, but overall it's practically the same presentation. So if you saw that, then you'll get a repeat today, but I'm hoping that that will be okay with you. So we'll start off, whoops, there we go. We'll start off with picture books. And the first one, although this is not an alpha, this particular book is not in alphabetical order by author, which the rest of them will be, I thought this was a good one to start with because tomorrow's Thanksgiving. Yeah. From the moment a boy wakes up and throughout the day, he gives thanks for many things in his life. Everything from the sun that wakes him up in the morning to the bees that didn't sting him that day. I think it's a really uh, fun look at different events in a child's life and the reason he could be thankful for his family, for um, his aunt and uncle, and his dog, everything. <laughs> this is a sequel to The Cow Who Laid an Egg, and in this sequel, the farmer's wife holds a beautiful baby contest for the cows and calves. Marjorie the cow enters Daisy, her child, who looks a lot like a chicken, <laughs> but the other cows think Daisy doesn't have a chance. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Strega Nona has Big Anthony help her prepare the earth, plant the seeds, and nurture the plants, and she is meticulous in her methods. Big Anthony throws some seeds over the fence and lets them grow every which way, because he wanted to grow something himself, too. After the harvest, Strega Nona learns that the village had a poor harvest that year, and she shares what she has with everyone. So again, kind of a thankful book yeah. for this time of year. I know, Halloween's over, but this one was such fun. It's a takeoff on Over in the Meadow. You children's librarians know that one. This counts through various Halloween-related cre creatures, and it goes from number one through number 13, which I also thought was fun for Halloween. Many of you probably already know this book, Let's Do Nothing. Friends Sal and Frankie have done everything, so now they try to do nothing. It's a big challenge for Frankie, he's the guy with the glasses, because he keeps coming up with disturbances for every scenario. Sal will say, let's just sit in our chairs like we're statues in the park and we can't move. And they're sitting there and you see them as statues. And then the pigeons come and they only <laughs> land on Frankie, they don't land on Sal. And it's quite fun and you know, it's kind of hard to do nothing. Mm -hmm. Roberto Walks Home is by Janice Harrington, who I consider a Nebraska author because she wrote, um, oh gosh, I can't think of the name of it, but um, she and her family moved to Lincoln when she was in third or fourth grade, and she went to school here, and she moved away later, but um, in this book, Roberto is waiting for his brother to walk him home. He's sitting on the school steps because his brother promised he would come and walk him home, but he doesn't show up, and finally, Roberto walks home alone. His excitement is gone, and when he sees his brother playing basketball, he is hurt and mad. And that green jacket tossed over his shoulder he wore proudly at the beginning of the book, his brother had given it. It's an old one of his that he had given to him. Towards the end of the book, he throws it down because he is so mad. But they do make up. And it says, based on characters created by Ezra Jack Keats, because it is that, that format, um, art-wise, and um, she... Janice Harrington was selected by the Ezra Jack Keats Foundation to write this book. So that's fascinating, too. Is it Rachel Isadora, I almost said Isadora Duncan. <laughs> what does that mean? Rachel Isadora has been um, retelling European fairy tales and setting them in Africa, which is really interesting. The artwork is beautiful, 
bright colors and collages that highlight each of the books, and children will enjoy hearing what I hope is a familiar tale to them with a new setting. And in this, on this list, I have Hans, Hansel and Gretel, Rapunzel, and The Ugly Duckling. And she has uh, more than that, five or six more that she's done so far. And they're all beautiful. So a nice addition to your fairy tale collection if you have the funding for that. Mm. Also in the fairy tale vein, but slightly different, is this version of um, the Pied Piper. In this one, an elf is given a magical pipe, but no one knows what the pipe's magic is. The elf does get the rats out of town, but he does not steal the children. He finds another way to deal with the mean town leader. With the artwork by Stephen Kellogg, of course, it's going to be busy and fun and uh, colorful. This might be a little dark. It's a little dark on my screen, but it's so much fun. It's a sequel to Bats at the Beach. Here they visit the library in the middle of the night, of course, and they enjoy all it has to offer. It's humorous, and you could also use this as a good introduction to things that you can find in a library when you have a class come in to, to visit. I actually have that book. My mom sent it to, oh. my sister and I are both librarians, <laughs> and my mom sent it to both of us this year for, for Halloween. She actually thought it you know, oh, caught her eye. <laughs> that's great. What fun. It is very fun, yes. This is about a young girl who um, has decided that this year, for the first time, she is going to observe Ramadan herself. Her family, of course, always does, and the children are not required to until they are re feel they are ready. And so the girl is, is, you know, it's different to not be able to eat or drink during the day until the sun goes down. But um, she's doing fine until she's invited to a classmate's birthday party. And she, her parents are concerned, and she wants to go, so she does go to the party. But when they serve uh, lemonade and cake, she can't have anything, and she really begins to feel the issue, you know. Mm. What I love about this book, besides this fact, it's, it's a nicely told story, are that the two families come together and they work out a way to have this smoothed over. So what they do is the, the Muslim family comes over to the birthday party girl's house after dark, and they all have cake and, and ice cream and lemonade to celebrate the birthday. Mm -hmm. And I love this coming together of cultures and finding a way to make something work instead of being a, a problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. My Family, Me Familia is a series by Pat Mora, who wrote our first book, the Give the Thanks, Gracias. And she has this family that uh, very simple stories of things that happen in everybody's lives. In this one, the family has a new kitty, and she likes to hide. Mm -hmm. And so the, the children, the three children, go to find her here and there. In the second book that came out lately, um, Danny, the boy, comes in to have lemonade with his family, and Mom notices his pockets are wiggling. <laughs> he has frogs in them. Oh, the frogs get into things in the house before Danny gets them all gathered up and back outside again. A whole, a whole different slant is Cromwell Dixon's Sky Cycle. And this is based on a true boy and a true event. He did invent this Sky Cycle. Um, there's a picture of, of him and his mother in the back. and He was a teen when he came up with this invention and brought it to the fair. And he designed it so that it's like a blimp-like thing that lifts him up. And then his pedals help him propel himself and turn. So it's very, I thought it was very interesting, and it's a, it's a fictional account of an actual event. Quite clever. This is an extremely silly book. <laughs> the whole thing is about these two voices arguing whether this drawing is a duck or a rabbit. And every time this creature does something, each side uses that for an argument for their side. <laughs> it goes into the grass. See the... The duck is hiding in the grass. No, the rabbit is looking for something to eat. So you never do find out which it is. I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> I told you the end. <laughs> I happen to love Skippy John Jones. I think he is hilarious. He's a little kitty boy. His ears are too big for his head, and his head is too big for his body. And he, desi he decides it's time to travel to Mars. He thinks he's a chihuahua because of the size of his ears and his head. I so see that. <laughs> he, he has... His uh, chihuahua friends, those chimichangas, who are actually little stuffed animals in his closet. When he goes into his closet, this is when all his imagination cuts free and he has exciting adventures. 
But he goes to Mars and he meets a one-eyed kitty. My friend Maria, who works here at the commission, she and her extended family love Skippy John Jones. They think he is hilarious. But there are some Hispanic people who are not fond of him who think he is um, inappropriate because he makes up Spanish words and Judy Shackner is not Hispanic and I can understand their point of view. So be aware of that, that some people aren't going to be thrilled with Skippy John Jones like I am. Then of course there's Splat who we met in Splat the Cat. This is a, a story about Valentine's Day. Splat can hardly wait to give Kitten the special Valentine he made for her until he finds out that Spike likes her too and he has a bigger Valentine for her. And Splat's pet mouse there on his tail, his name is Seymour, and Seymour is always involved in Splat's adventures. Then there's also a Christmas one. In this one, all Splat wants for Christmas is a big present. He really doesn't care what's in there. He just wants it to be big. And that's quite fun, too. This is about the third or fourth book about the group of animals that live at the, the one lady's house. They've all pretty much been rescued from the storm, as Duck was. And this time, Max the Duck is sympathetic when a large alligator asks for help in hiding from the zoo detective. Mm. All the other animals are afraid because they are all animals that the alligator would normally eat. <laughs> <laughs> but they do let him in. And then they find out why he's in trouble at the zoo. And, of course, I also love Scaredy Squirrel. This is the fourth book, I think, about Scaredy Squirrel. And Scaredy has so many things that he's afraid of. This one deals with what he's afraid of at night. He could have bad dreams about ghosts, dragons, polka dot monsters. So he has a well-thought-out plan to stay awake and to keep safe, as usual. Great. The glow-in-the-dark book, too? Well, he, his teeth in the, on ah. the cover, they do glow in the dark because <laughs> he is... A friendly guy, but always scared. <laughs> now we'll talk about a few beginning reader books that I've seen lately. I like Cork and Fuzz. In this one, um, Cork finds and then loses a green rock, which Fud, Fuzz soon finds on the ground. Fuzz believes in finders keepers, and he doesn't want to give the rock back, back to Cork. It's a great friendship story, as they all are so far, and also it's an issue that kids deal with in their normal lives. It's Who's, who does this belong to? And if I find it, is Finders Keepers really the right way to go? This is a little nonfiction story about basic information about the elephant life cycle, including how they use their trunks and why they're now threatened. They, this um, All Aboard Science Reader has several different books about different animals. I love this one. I put it on the summer reading program list, too. This is by, of course, Jean Craighead George. So a boy finds a hatching egg by a pond, and a gosling hatches out right then and imprints on him. So he's got to take care of this gosling. Well, it isn't too long before a hatching dunk duckling imprints on the goose. So now he, there's a trio, and they are together all the time. And the boy has his hands full. There's a few life science facts that are included in an unobtrusive way. And, of course, at the end of the summer... The gosling and the duckling, who've grown quite a bit, are headed off to, to uh, migrate. It's good fun and a great summer reading program title. Meg's family has moved to a new town, and she is thrilled to make a new friend, Jill, who happens to live on a pony farm. How could that be bad? <laughs> Soon the girls include a shy classmate named Annie, and they decide to form a club called the Pony Scouts. So, of course, this is book one about the Pony Scouts. And look, we have book two already. <laughs> and that two up there, that's the level of the, the I can read level, so you know how many, how many words are on a page. And two, Meg and Annie are staying overnight at Jill's house, and they get their first writing lesson. Then they stay up late, and when they decide to visit the ponies at night, they get quite a surprise. The new pony is having a foal. So for those boys who don't like ponies, or at least not the Pony Scouts book, they can read about monster trucks um, and also police cars. These are Blast Off Readers number one level, so they'll have a very limited number of words on a page. But I think just having some nonfiction titles that attract boys, of course, is always a good plan. 
Pearl and Wagner, there are a couple, three books out about them. Oh, this is book three. Wagner the Mouse does not enjoy April Fool's Day as he falls for one joke after another. It's even worse when he thinks something is a joke and it's not. They really are having a test. April Fool's permeates all three stories in this collection, and students will relate to Wagner's feelings and his joy in getting the last laugh. He finally joins in on the fun. And of course, I'm very fond of Cowgirl Kate and Coco. I think this is book four about them. In this book, Cowgirl Kate wakes up to a nuzzle from Coco. He's in the house. And he thinks the stalls in the house are much better than the ones in the barn. One of them even has a refrigerator. So Kate has to convince him to get out of the house and back to the barn before her parents get home. And of course, Coco is thinking he's not too interested in that. <laughs> he's, he's kind of his own guy. They're very fun. A few nonfiction picture books. Um, this first one is a look at different dinosaurs giving a perspective on their sizes. And at the top of the page, you can read this just with a rhyming text. Just read through and turn the pages and look at the dinosaurs, and it's a very simple story. If you want to, you can look at the bottom of each page, and there, there's a silhouette of each of the several dinosaurs that are highlighted on that page. And so you can tell this silhouette is exactly that dinosaur. And, and next to the silhouette is just a list of facts. The name of the dinosaur, how to pronounce it, what um, period or age it lived in, how big it was, things like that. So it's kind of a, you could also use it as just a, a matching. Here's the silhouette, where's the dinosaur that fits that? Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of fun. It has a variety of things that you could use. <clears throat> you know, along about Kentucky Derby time, if you wanted to, you could read this book if you're reading about horse racing. This focuses on one jockey, Jimmy Wake Winkfield, and it tells of the changing times in horse racing because early on in the late 1800s, most jockeys were black. Jimmy, who they called Wink, won the Kentucky Derby in 1901, 1902, and came second in 1903. That's why he's the last black king of the Kentucky Derby. Because then economics and racial tension forced most black jockeys out of the business, and Wink went on to race in Europe. So you get a little bit of a sense of... Um, prejudice and, and uh, se segregation along with uh, information about horse racing. This is a beautiful book. It's got excellent color photos that highlight this introduction to the life cycle of the eastern bluebird. And there's about two to five sentences per page to, to just tell the child a little bit of what's going on. And you really don't even, you could barely need those sentences because the pictures so eloquently tell the story. This is a very simplified telling of Greg Mortensen's story he told in his book for adults, Three Cups of Tea. This will give readers and listeners a sense of lives that are lived quite differently from their own. And I like the idea of looking at somewhere else in the world where people don't live exactly like we do. And thinking of that, here's this book called When at Six O'Clock in San Francisco. This is a look at the different time zones and the different lives led around the world. This all anchored at 6 o'clock in the morning in San Francisco. When it's 6 o'clock in San Francisco, it's 2 o'clock in London, and the, the boy might be playing soccer with his friends. So it's, it's simple, but it also is carrying through a story about the time zones and how it's not the same time everywhere, and people live differently around the world. This is a lyrical tribute to Coretta Scott, briefly telling of her childhood, her marriage to Martin Luther King Jr., and their work in the church, as well as for equal rights. It's certainly not anything you could write a report from, but it's just a, a recognition of her contribution to the world. Fiction for grades two to five or so. We'll start with Cam Jansen. I don't even know. Oh, right, here it says right here. This is number 30 on the Cam Jansen books. And this book has three stories in it. So the school is having a sports day at the park, and the first mystery occurs while the students are walking to the park because the bakery is robbed. So, and then there's two more mysteries at the park. And of course, with her photographic memory, Cam Jansen can help solve the mysteries. This is the sequel to The Puzzling World of Winston Breen. Winston loves puzzles, and he and his friends spend a day solving puzzles to reveal a prize. 
They are one team among 10 trying to win $50,000 for their school. It's readable and compelling, and there's puzzles every so many pages that readers can solve, or they can look in the back of the book and find out the answer and go on with this, the story. It's, it's really um, great fun. Will David, having just turned 12, takes over his brother's newspaper route just in time to find out the newspaper will no longer be provided to his town. Steel. I think it's Pennsylvania. He is determined to fight this decision. On another note, he decides to investigate a new game, a new game at the fair, which promises a thousand dollar prize. And he wonders what the catch is, because he's figured out all the other games at the fair. He's a smart kid. He is being homeschooled with his mother. His brothers go to the school, and he uses the library a lot and is a good researcher. Um, I think readers will be curious about the outcome of both of these issues, and Will is a character who might show up again. I wouldn't be surprised. <clears throat> the angel stays in a stone tower in a small town in the Swiss Alps. <clears throat> she claims she has no gender, but I'm going to call her she because I need to do something. <laughs> she also has trouble with the language, and she often uses the wrong word or the wrong form of the word when she's talking which you could either find very endearing or very irritating. <laughs> I happen to find it endearing, so I think this is a fun book. She um, helps people. She's not really sure what she's supposed to be doing or what maybe any power she might have is. But when people in the village start to have altercations, she floats down and she kind of floats between them and calms the, the atmosphere, calms them down so that they cease fighting with each other. And that's really all she's done the many, many years that she's been there. And she's feeling like you know, she's contributing. Well, then Zola arrives with her father to open a school. Zola can see the angel. Nobody else can see her. And she keeps asking her to do something about the problems of the people in town. She'll just climb up to the top of the tower and say, Angel, what are you going to do about those nine kids hiding in the barn, you know, three miles up the road? And the angel goes, what? I don't, what are you talking about? I don't know. And it's quite fun because um, Zola really activates not only the angel, but other people in the town. And the angel and Zola help remind the townspeople to do the right thing for others. It's a very fun and kind of a different story for Sharon Creech. Roland and his older brother Shelby each want the chance for one of them to become a knight. Their wise blacksmith father must, must make the choice, so he devises a way for them to show their true skills and beliefs. And this is the first book in a new series. Sassy Simone Sanford, nine, is tired of being called Little Sister. Her whole family calls her that. They keep forgetting to call her Sassy. Then her family is in a tough situation, and Sassy is the one who comes through for everybody. They're trapped in an elevator during a, a blackout when they're um, the only person who's small enough to fit through the partially opened elevator door is Sassy. It's quite fun, and I, this is also the beginning of a series. This is a new one on my list, in case you hadn't noticed. Mm -hmm. Deja is so excited about her eighth birthday, even if her aunt did make her invite all the girls in her class at school. Then she finds out that Antonia is having a Just Because party on the very same day, maybe just to ruin Deja's party. And this, of course, birthdays are so important to kids, and having your birthday ruined would be a big catastrophe when you're turning eight. This is another book by Jean Craighead George, and it's about the cats who are feral cats and their lives near the Rocksville train station, and the people who take an interest in them and try to help them out, and even sometimes try to domesticate them. Okay. And they're not always very interested in that, <laughs> although they do like to keep warm. <laughs> another new series. Uh, Diamond is in third grade. She's new in town, and she is raring to go. Full of energy, energy and a positive attitude, she wonders why the other new kid, whose name is Free, he's a boy, she wonders why he's so grumpy. Diamond is going to figure him out. And I don't know if Free really wants to be figured out, but, you know, you're not going to hold Diamond. <laughs> this is another one of the baseball card adventure books. When Stosh is hit in the head with a baseball and survives, he learns how lucky he is compared to Ray Chapman, the only major league player to die after being hit by the ball. Stosh goes back in time to try to save Ray and to try and convince him to wear a batting helmet, which, of 
course, Ray thinks looks ridiculous. <laughs> but it's a very good story about a, a baseball, major league baseball player I'd never heard of until this book came along. This is a sequel to Uh-Oh, Cleo, and this easygoing family story tells of bossy older sister Jenna and annoying younger brother Jack. The family takes a trip to Colorado to visit Grandma, and while they're there, they climb Mount Baldy. On the top, they encounter a freak snow snowstorm. To keep warm, yes, their mother pulls out extra pair of underpants and has them all put them on their heads. The most fun of this book, while it's all quite fun, is the photo of the author inside the back cover. She's about eight years old, and she's on a Colorado mountain with <laughs> underwear on her head. I think we know where she got this idea. Crusher, <clears throat> excuse me, Crusher, as named by her captor, is a free-roaming gopher snake until she is caught and placed in a terrarium by Hunar. Sometimes humorous and sometimes sad, this book looks at captivity of wild creatures and of the neglect some receive from their easily distracted young captors. Anthropomorphic heavy, the reptiles can communicate telepathically, but the creative and unusual activities do not detract from the point. The most fun is the hunger strike Crusher holds. <clears throat> and her eventual affection for the live mouse that she refused to eat. The live mouse is named Lunch, <laughs> which is what Gunnar said when he put her in there. Um, this is book eight about Martin Bridge. In the first story, Martin's mom is practicing the keyboard almost nonstop, and Martin is sick of it because she is terrible. He keeps wishing she would quit, but then he learns a little something about his mom. In the second story, Layla a girl who sits in front of Martin in school joins the Junior Badgers and she ruins everything because Junior Badgers are supposed to be boys. Or does she? I love this new series. This is book one. Of course, I love this um, format. It's told in their usual style of no narrative, just letters, newspaper articles, illustrations, notes. The authors tell of Ignatius B. Grumpley, best-selling author of a children's book series, who has rented the old house in Gasly, Illinois, to, in order to write one more um, book into this series, only to find it comes complete with a boy, Seymour, and a ghost. Mr. Grumpley has writer's block, and he is not pleased his house comes already occupied. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the sequel to Swindle, and in this book, the man with the plan is back, and so is his crew. When they learn that all aboard animals, a floating zoo, has stolen Savannah's pet monkey, they come up with a plan to get her back. And we know the man with a plan is going to be able to pull it through. <laughs> this is the, the sequel to, oh gosh, what was the first Theodosia? Um, anyway, this is book two. It's the early 1900s in London, and Theodosia, who's 11, helps her father with the work at his Museum of Legends and Antiquities. And, of course... Her mother brings the ancient artifacts back from Egypt, and Theodosia has a gift. Her parents don't know this, but she is very good at ferreting out secrets and curses, and she can look at these artifacts and know, oh my, this is a terrible curse. I have to get rid of this before it gets anybody. Well, in this second book, Theodosia accidentally finds the staff of Osiris in the storage room, and soon a number of people are after it, and they are all unscrupulous. This is book four about Gurney, Goonie Bird, and she decides she needs to keep, keep her brain warm so it will work better. And she begins to wear her true ponytail hat, which is a pair of frilly underwear. I don't know if they talked with the other author or not. <laughs> Got a theme going. <clears throat> Soon other classmates follow her example, and Mrs. Pigeon is supportive and understanding. She's a very good teacher. The class is studying poetry, learning about haiku, limericks, and other things, and the teacher reads some poems written by her mother, Mrs. X. The class feels the loss when Mrs. X dies, and they find the perfect tribute to her. Ban Banjo, the great walloper Bishbash, is 11, and he has a wicked hitting slump while his team is working toward the baseball championship. Can you see that black cloud over his head? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The slump is manifested as that dark cloud, and it gets in his way sometimes. His friends all have humorous names, and there's some fun comments in the book, such as, the place was like a suitcase at the airport. Packed. Still, Banjo's slump is real, and he knows he needs to find a way to get past it. Another baseball-type story, 
This is book four in the Scraps of Time series. James and Peter Turner are a year apart, but they look like twins. They are baseball crazy during the Depression and are beyond thrilled when Josh Gibson rooms at their house while his team is in town. And it includes some information and a timeline of the Negro Leagues. <coughs> Excuse me. This is another story about Simply Sarah. Sarah is assigned to report on a country, and she has decided to report on Mexico, where her friend and neighbor Mercedes was born. She brings a special surprise to school as part of her report, Mercedes. Oh, I love Down Girl and Sit. They are so silly. This is the third book about them. Down Girl and Sit, whose names really are Happy and Dot, continue to do their best to protect their respective properties and owners, much to the owner's chagrin. They really believe their names are Down Girl. The other dog thinks her name is Sit. And they think that the neighbor's cat's name is here Kitty Kitty. And they are always doing things. It's so much fun to read it from the dog's point of view and how they, they help their masters get up every morning and other things. Book three about Autoline. In this one, Autoline and Mr. Monroe meet Cecily Forbes Lawrence III at the park, and soon all three of them are off to boarding school, the Alice B. Smith School for the Differently Gifted. Numerous bizarre and unexplained things are happening at the school, and the there are illustrations in black and white and blue throughout the story to add to the fun. This is kind of a retort to Diary of a Wimpy Kid. It's an Australian import, and it will probably be popular with the same crowd. Max is positive that he is not a bully. After all, he has never hit anyone. He does, however, convince them to do what he wants. Nordstrom, well, really his name is Triffin Nordstrom, is assigned to be Max's tutor for math, and things may start to change. This is the fifth book of this popular character, and it's the first one I've read. I ran a, I've heard of him before. There is no text used in any, any of this series except for little words like an action, like shiver, shiver. The story is completely conveyed through the illustrations. They're black and white throughout. Um, this, the stories in this, you don't have to have read the earlier books to enjoy these stories. Um, they're very gentle stories, and um, I've been told that they're popular with um, from elementary school all the way through high school. So see if that's true in your community. <clears throat> this one is quite fun and sometimes very silly. Some, are, some of the stories are humorous, some of them are groaners. There are numerous short stories told in manga style, so you start at the back of the book. They're black and white art, and throughout is just stories about dinosaurs, as if they're acting kind of human-like, except they do still eat each other, and there can be blood dripping. But it's only black and white art, so that's not so bad. And um, again, silly and goofy. And with that one on the front there, I'm pretty sure there's going to be another book. This is the, the sequel to Jellaby. This is Jellaby Monster in the City. Portia Bennett and Jason are taking Jellaby into the city when the story continues. They find the door Jellaby remembers and think they are on the brink of bringing him home when more trouble occurs. It's a satisfying continuation of the story, and it, and this could either could stop now or it could go on for more stories because they really haven't found where Jellaby belongs. Three vignettes give a sense of Lincoln's love for his sons, especially Willie and Tad. It is sympathetic, sympathetic, sympathetically told, covering incidents from 1859 to 1865. Just little short vignettes, and because they're retold, it's in the fiction section. Um, sequel to Locomotion. In this book, Lonnie has decided to be the rememberer for her, his sister. He and his sister live with different foster families that sense their parents' death in a fire. This book is all letters with only three poems that tells her about what is happening now with both of them and also an occasional memory of before. Um, the war makes an appearance with his foster mom, Miss Edna, who is worried about one of her sons in Iraq. It's a worthy sequel. Some nonfiction. This is an overview of man's concepts of space, highlighting the U.S. space program. Good introductory information for browsers. 
And of course, it's by Buzz Aldrin, so that can't be bad. <clears throat> Four fold out pages highlight this look at reptiles. Basic information is included on snakes, lizards, turtles, crocodiles, and alligators. Some illustrations are marked actual size, others are not labeled as such, so I would think that probably they're not. Definitely will appeal to um, boys. This is book eight uh, about um, Tommy DePaola's childhood. And in this one, the author talks about rationing for the duration, blackouts for the duration, and also everyday things like his upcoming dance recital. He also has an unexpected reaction to his special choir singing the Army Air Corps anthem. His cousin Blackie was shot down, and the words of the song bring it all back to him. He has to run out of the room and into the boys' bathroom. So it's very heartfelt and also gives a sense of the time and also of one person's life as a child at that time. The title of this is Barbarians. You can't read it over there, top of there. It has one chapter each on Goths, Huns, Vikings, and Mongols that gives good basic information about each group. And you can tell right from this illustration that you're going to get some good information about weaponry, <laughs> which of course is very appealing to certain boys. This might look like a picture book, but it's really riddles of well-known children's books to provide a fun quiz for readers. And um, the reason I put this in the older group is because some of the books that the riddles refer to are novels. Some are picture books. And just looking at this artwork, you can pick out what probably a few of those um, riddles are going to be about. And then I think having the kids write up riddles for one of their own favorite books would be great fun. This has good basic information on the steps needed to complete a research paper. It's well organized and easy to follow. And it's one of the better books about this that I've seen and really emphasizes if you follow these steps, you're going to be writing it in your own words, and it's important to, to write in your own words and not copy out of another book. More books in the You Wouldn't Want To series. Um, the, this popular series tells of historic events in a humorous and gruesome way. Illustrations dominate the pages with snippets of information and plenty of smart aleck remarks thrown in. <laughs> and you got the word body snatcher up there. That book is going off the shelf right now. <laughs> Excellent photos highlight this look at very big and very little insects, including a map of the world at the back of the book that points out where each insect mentioned lives. Again with the three cups of tea, but this is a novel length um, retelling of his story that he told in his adult book. It's geared to you know, um, this age group, and I think, again, finding out about how important school is for a group of people who haven't, who the kids climb up, and, and right in the dirt at the beginning of the story, they're doing their schoolwork, but they don't have a building. And again, I think this is good things for our children to learn about. Okay, this is an introductory look at how different parts of the body function. And interestingly, there's no reference to the reproductive system. That's mm -hmm. the one that causes us trouble, right? And I think it's because it's about organs and how they can be replaced. Mm -hmm. We haven't really come up with something about that. <laughs> For that part of the body. It does include the urinary system with only an outline drawing of a body with an X on the place where the bladder would be. Just giving you information so you know what's in this book. I think it does a good job of explaining the different functions of these different organs and I think it'll be a good addition to your collection. This is a follow-up to his earlier book, If the World Were a Village, and of course this title shows the reader the makeup of the United States if we were just one village. How many of us would have a college education and things like that? A photo essay of the people of Everest, their culture, the animals, and the geography and climate of their world. It does also mention some of the well-known climbers like Sir Edmund Hillary, but this book is really about the people who live there all year round and about Everest. Oh yeah, this is going to be popular. <laughs> How to make fake vomit, fake dog poo, and more. It includes the necessary cautions regarding using the stove or using a sharp knife. But yes, 25 great special effects. Well, particular at Halloween's gone now, I know, but next year around Halloween time. This is going to be popular. Fiction for younger teens. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. Yeah, 15 minutes left. 
Seventh grader Sophie, who's the narrator, Margaret, Rebecca, and Leanne are asked to solve puzzles and math to find a ring left by the elderly neighbor's father for her daughter. Phew, side story is about a possible boyfriend for Sophie. These girls go to a Catholic school, and the school is right next to the church, and the, the elderly lady lives in an apartment that's kind of between the two buildings and kind of connected to both of them. And the first in a series, of course. This is volume three of, the, of Vladimir Todd. In this, the ongoing saga of half-vampire Vlad in and out of school, he continues to learn new vampire skills and he's trying hard to survive. But there is something of a conspiracy against him because he shouldn't exist. And he's not sure who he can trust. His uncle had to leave and uh, the, there's a, a really rotten vampire after him wanting to get rid of him. So he's got his hands full. Oh yeah, and then there's school too. <laughs> Paul is 13 and he and his grandfather are Abenaki. And they've been kidnapped by treasure hunters to lead them to the legendary treasure of an Abenaki monster on a mountain near their home. It's good te tension and a touch of the scary. So this is another in Joseph Bouchock's series of modern day stories based on ancient Abenaki monsters. And I think that that's always appealing to kids. <clears throat> Excuse me again. The story is told in free verse. Matt, who's now 11, was 9 when he was airlifted out of Vietnam. He remembers his mother and brother, and he has a secret that haunts him. He has um, a new family in the United States that are very supportive and wonderful to him, care a great deal about him, but he has to get past this secret of his past before he can really embrace his family. This is book one of The Hunting. Adam is 13 and his father has been developing a very realistic video game using Adam as his model and tester. When his father disappears, Adam is concerned. But when the apartment building is demolished by something no one can see, he is running for his life. In this science fiction title, a group of unscrupulous people have stolen information and forced Adam's father to help create a genetically altered Tyrannosaurus Rex called Z-Rex, and it is intelligent. Adam must try to save his father while avoiding the creature, or will the Z-Rex be able to help him? Oh, you can't see much of anything on this one. <laughs> the Spook's Tale and Other Horrors, there's three shorter stories in this companion book to the Last Apprentice series. The first tells how Tom Wood's master became a spook. The second tells of Alice's history before she met Tom, and the third, how Grimalkin became the witch assassin. Assassin, It's sure to be popular with readers of the series. Josh is 12, and he's hoping to help the school baseball team when his father, a former minor league player, pulls him off of the school team to have him try out for a traveling team hosted by the local go-getter Rocky Valentine. Josh makes the team, but he isn't sure about Rocky's schemes. Rocky sells additives to his team players, and they're legal. But then some of the other players offer Josh steroids, and he has to decide, what am I going to do? Another book by the same author, this is the sequel to Football Genius. Troy, who's 12, can predict winning plays for the Atlanta Falcons because somehow he knows what the opponent's defense plans to do. Now the NFL is investigating him and trying to find out if and how he is cheating. This is the third book in the in the Vampire Island series. The title and um, character, well, in this series it focuses on Lexi, who's about 14. She's the oldest of the three children. All of her immediate family are focusing on giving up all vampire impulses in order to try to become fully human. Lexi finds herself losing ground as she, ground as she completes, competes for ninth grade president and does some underhanded deeds to further her cause, which also takes her back away from being human. Prometheus Jones is 13, and he was born on the day slaves were freed, though he's never been a slave. But he finds himself and his younger cousin fleeing injustice and heading for Texas. Jones wants to try his, to find his father, so they both join a cattle drive to earn some money before beginning their search. Cowboys did not have an easy life, and there are, are personal loss and heartbreak in store for Prometheus. He is an honest, honorable young man and faces trouble head on. 
High school junior Marcus and his mother moved to town in the middle of the summer. Marcus hopes to make the football team, but has no friends to practice with. When he is throwing passes at a picture frame in the park, and a 50-something-year-old man catches it, he has found someone to help him get ready. But Charlie sometimes acts peculiar, and Marcus keeps getting blamed for Charlie's pranks. What is up with this guy? Well, it turns out he has early onset Alzheimer's from, he had been a pro football player, and it's from the uh. con concussions that he's had. It is 1958, and Bob Barnhart, 12, and his family have moved in next door to Mrs. Dowdle. His father is a minister and is starting a church in town. Trouble and surprises are in store for the new neighbors. Grandma Dowdle is still in fine form 20 years after we last spent time with her. These, both of these books are sequels to Dead is the New Black. Daisy and her two sisters and their mom all have different psychic powers and often help the local police. In book two, Dead is a State of Mind, a new student predicts a teacher's murder, which occurs, and it looks like a werewolf has done it. In Dead is So Last Year, people of Nightshade, California have started seeing doppelgangers all over town. Daisy thinks she has seen her own father, who's been missing for several years. What is going on? Of course, everybody probably knows The Last Olympian, the fifth and final book in the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, and this title maintains the series quality. This is a prequel to the Bone series, and it tells the story of Rose and her twin, Briar. They are to go and take their final tests to complete their training in controlling and understanding their dreams. But then there is a betrayal, and this is a graphic novel format. Enola returns in this fifth book to find her landlady's house ransacked, the kitchen girl tied up, and her landlady kidnapped. Enola is at a loss as who would do such a thing and immediately sets out to find and rescue Mrs. Tupper. Then we have the 39 Clues series continuing. Book 4 takes place in Egypt. Book 5, they go to Russia. And Book 6, they're in Australia. They're not really following a clue this time. They just wanted to reconnect with their Uncle Shep and repeat a trip their parents had made, Amy and Dan's parents had made many years ago. But while they're there, they stumble on a clue. Billy is 12, and his older sister have joined the 1897 Klondike Gold Rush. They're trying to find their father on the trail because their mother passed away from the fever. The first thing Edna does when they hit the trail is cut her hair and change her name to Ed because she's not sure that Edna would be a good person to be out there on the trail with just her younger brother. And they have many adventures in trying to find their father. Come on. Okay, never mind. <clears throat> Why don't you want to go on? It wants to stop there. Thank you. <laughs> it likes you. <clears throat> we have a little bit more time, so let's go on to teen nonfiction. Um, the authors who brought us bodies from the bog and bodies from the ash now has a photo essay of the recovery of bodies from European glaciers. Most of the bodies are a couple of hundred years old, but one is from the copy, copper age, and he's about 5,300 years old. An even-handed biography of what is known about Babe Ruth. The author notes, when, a, when appropriate, the different versions of specific stories and how even Babe Ruth himself was unclear on what was true. Mm -hmm. It's certain to be popular with readers who love sports stories. It reads like a story. <coughs> oh yeah, there's going to be trouble now. <laughs> I have read snippets of this book, not the whole thing. It is full of practical joke type ideas. The reviews emphasize that the book constantly reminds readers that pranks should do no harm and help clean up your mess. And by the way, stay in school, learn something, and become a useful citizen of the world. So while they are learning how to do mischief, they're also maybe learning a couple of other things. The stories of three different scientists is told. One flies into the eyes of hurricanes to collect data. One explores caves, hunting microbes that live in extreme conditions. And the third is the first person to climb into and research life at the top of the redwoods. Very different. This is a sequel to um, The Circuit and Breaking Through. Now Francisco is in college, and he has a whole new set of challenges to face. 
I, again, an excellent book about someone who's come from a completely different culture, Mexico, and into the United States. And of course, it's set a number of years ago because now he is a college professor. But interesting to, to hear his remembrances of this part of his life. Oh, I should hurry. This is a photo journal of the Dust Bowl. It's well organized and tells of the conditions that brought about the Dust Bowl and about the thousands of people who became homeless during this time. And it does include an index. This is an encyclopedic look at many things connected with death. Entries include assassination, body snatching, hearse, limbo, soul. The author includes Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Buddhism, and other religions when appropriate to the topic. In alternating narratives, it tells the stories of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr from birth through school, military service, careers, and politics, and how they ended up facing each other that early morning. A look at the war in Iraq through one young man's experience. He was a member of an equipment crew which repaired um, craters made by IEDs, moved earth to create berms, and occasionally interacted with the children of Iraq. Language is crude at times, and one scene is quite hard to read. They are salvaging army from armor from a vehicle in which two soldiers died. A photo essay of the early 1960s and the 13 women who were tested to determine if they could become astronauts, called the Mercury 13. Physical endurance tests, psychological analysis. Even with all of this, there were very few who took them seriously. The book contains a letter a copy of a letter about the women across which then President Lyndon Johnson wrote, let's stop this now. It includes an index. Okay, fiction for older teens. We're going to make it. <laughs> this is just a fun book. Morgan Abbott is a senior in high school and she's the daughter of the first female president. She has all the regular challenges of a teen plus the added pressure of the nosy press and a mom who is very busy. There is a bit of a stretch in here when she is, acts as a decoy for her mom, but teen girls will go for it, and also with two girls in the White House right now, it might be oh, kind yeah. of fun, although she's, uh, of course, a senior in high school, a little older than those girls. Graceling is the first book um, in this series by Cashore. Cat uh, is about 15, and, and uh, she lives in a, it's a fantasy, so she lives in a, one of several countries where many people are born with a grace which means they have some kind of ability that is almost supernatural. Mm. They, can, they can't be defeated. And she thinks that her grace is to kill, and that really rips her apart. Mm. Her uncle is using her as a, a thug, so to speak, to coerce people into doing what he wants or to punish them if they don't. But she finds a way out of that situation, and she goes off to find out really who she is and, and what she can do. It's a very interesting story, and it's... Um, companion book, because I think this one takes place before Graceling. Um, fire is a human monster, and anyone who looks at her is irresistibly drawn toward her. It's very hard for humans to, to shield their minds from her, and she, she also has to try not to draw people, but it's difficult. Her father used this skill for his own gain and the gain of the king, but she resists this and tries to live as humanly as possible. When she is asked to help the king retain his crown, she finds danger, treachery, and betrayal, but also human companionship. It's a very intriguing story. Another intriguing story is The Hunger Games, and this is the first book of a projected trilogy. Katniss Everdeen is 16, and she volunteers to take the place of her younger sister, Prim, in The Reaping. Each year, each of the districts of Panem, which is formerly the United States, so this is futuristic, they must send two children to participate in the games. So think gladiators. Mm -hmm. They're going to be in a, in a physical environment that is hard on them, and they're fighting each other until only one is left. There's some gruesome situations, but um, somehow you're still compelled to read this book. Mm -hmm. And the sequel, which just came out, I think, last month, is catching fire, and in this, I'm not giving much away to tell you that Katniss is back in the games, and so are all the other champions. And this is book two. Can't wait for book three. Three excellent short stories, each of 
which has one or two earlier Crutcher characters in them. As expected, language will be an issue for libraries, but very well told stories, of course. This is the sequel to Under a War-Torn Sky, which I have not read. It's World War II. Henry is 19, and he was in the war, shot down, managed to escape. That happened in the first book. Now he feels he must return to France to find out what happened to the boy, Pierre, who was nine at the time, who helped him escape the Germans. He sees firsthand the terrible conditions left behind. When he first goes back to France, Hitler is still in power, but he's lost control of France, and he is, uh, his power is waning. But he sees how, even though the Nazis are gone, people are still starving because the railroads have been destroyed, and there's hard to get things from here to there. It's a part of the war that I really hadn't thought about before. It's very well written. It is World War II. Ida Mae Jones just graduated from high school, and all she wants is to fly. She hears about the WASP program, Women Air Force Service Pilots, and hopes she can get in. But she is black, a very light black, should she try to pass as white. Mm -hmm. It's a novel of the segregation of black, black people and of the limits set on women at that time. And the last book I'll talk about are his response. His two friends talk Noah, 17, into going into the neighboring all-white neighborhood to steal a car. Before they get one, three local teens spot them and chase them. Noah trips and falls and is beaten in the head with a baseball bat. The book explores guilt and innocence, the trial of the white boys, the meaning of a hate crime, and Noah's determination to do things right from now on. And thank you. Notice, I think you just click it and it'll say thank you. <laughs> and that's that's the list for today. So I hope that's um I didn't even stop to give anybody a chance to ask questions. Uh, does anybody have any comments about some of the titles or questions before we call it quits? If you have any questions or comments, um I'm unmuting any everyone if you have a microphone, you can feel free to use it. If not, you can post a question or comment in the questions section. Um, anybody have anything they want to say? Any questions for Sally? Maybe I talked about your favorite book or the worst book. <laughs> <laughs> There's a thank you. Great. Thank you. Always enjoy your, always enjoy your book, John. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. It looks like everyone um, we're at the end of our time here, but that's okay. Um, if you do have questions or anything about these books you want to know more, of course, you can look at the list that's on the website. Um, oh, I forgot to tell them about it. That's okay. Yeah, um, well, that's the email that you sent. Yeah. Yes, th this list of all these is on um, the email that was sent out to you on the website. Um, we'll also have that linked off of the recording, too, when I get that posted up for people who didn't attend the session and didn't get the email um, um, from Sally. So uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting. I got a lot of good ideas for um, Christmas presents, I think. Good, good. <laughs> this is a good time for, for you to do that. Yes, this. absolutely. Um, so I hope you'll join us next week when we'll have Michael Sowers, also from the Library Commission, is going to give some talk about Google Secrets, some new features and things that Google has come out with that might be um, interesting to people. So uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.